Let's pray together. Lord God, as we turn our attention to your word this morning, we are so thankful for it. And we are thankful that you are here with us even now and faithful to your people and faithful to call us to yourself and make us your own. And Lord, we, we believe something about, about you, that you not only saved us, Lord, but you are at work in our lives by your spirit and through your word. And so as we now bring our minds and our hearts and our attention to the study of the word, we rejoice and praise you that you have given it to us, that you have spoken truth in, in ways that we would understand, that you would guide us, Lord, according to your will and teach us the things that we should know and teach us, Lord, what does it mean to, to live in the world that we are in, this world that is yours and that you have given to us. And even as we reflect upon the text before us today, we pray that we would be able to draw out things from it that would guide and lead and help us to serve you faithfully and to know, Lord, what our calling is in, in the world that you've given and, and that we would be, Lord, sources of hope and light and the gospel uh, in this world. And so we pray that you would bless us, Lord, and help us today to hear, to receive, to believe, and to apply your word to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you open them with me to Genesis chapter 4? Uh, here at Redeemer, over the last oh, several months, after we, you know, we took this break for Christmas, but before that, we were, we've been looking at a sermon series taken from Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 11. And this morning, we are going to pick up where we la last left off, which was uh, in, in Genesis 4. And we'll start our reading at verse 16, and we'll read down through the end of that chapter, which is verse 26. And let me just say a couple of things by way of, of introduction for those of you who may be guests with us today, just to catch you up to where we are in the story. Uh, Genesis 4 is, is, is really the account of what happened with, uh, with Adam and Eve's children, the first two children, with Cain and Abel. And you may remember, even if you haven't read it for a while, if you're new here, that, that Cain became jealous and angry with his brother because God received uh, the offering of Abel because Abel gave that offering in faith and, and he, he would not accept Cain's offering. And so as a result of that, Cain uh, killed his, his brother. And then in last week's sermon, the passage we reflected on last week, uh, we saw how um, God came to Cain and, and brought what was just, just judgment and punishment upon him for his sin. But at the same time he did that, we also saw how even in God's response to Cain for something so horrific as, as murdering his brother, that God did show grace and mercy to Cain and protecting him from others taking his life by giving him whatever that mark was uh, that he gave to Cain. He gave it to him as a, as a gracious act of protection. Now, the passage that we're looking at today, it, it follows up on what then happens with, with Cain after that. And I think we learn a lot of things here about about just life in the world and how we are to think about the world. So beginning in verse 16, we read these words. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord, and he settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And when he built the city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad fathered Mahujael, and Mahujael fathered Methushael, and Methushael fathered Lamech. Lamech and Lamech took two wives. The name of the one was Ida, and the name of the other, Zillah. Ida bore Jabel, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah also bore Tubal-Cain, and he was the forger of all instruments of bronze and iron. The sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ida and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain reven Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. And to Seth also a son was born. And he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And may he bless us now as we, as we study this passage and seek to apply it to our lives. 
You know, something that, that the church has, has wrestled with and struggled with uh, throughout the ages, and it continues to be a highly debatable topic today as well, is, is how do we think about and, and live in and respond to this, this world that we are a part of, that, that, is, that is our world, it is, it is our home. And, and how do we, as believers in Christ, how do we think about the world that we are in? Now, one of the things that is, is obvious, and we've talked about this in this sermon series, is we know that the world has fallen. You know, when you think about what happened with, with Adam and Eve and their rebellion against God and their turning from God, that, that not only meant that Adam and Eve were fallen into sin and rebellious and, and therefore then at that point corrupt, but also that, that same thing would, would be true for their descendants, for us, and they would also be true for the world that we live in, that, that, that the world that we live in is a fallen world. And yet even as we, we get that and we understand that, that our world is broken, that our world is fallen and corrupt, at the same time we, we understand that, we also have to ask ourselves, well, well, what does that then mean for us as believers in Christ? What does that mean in terms of how, how we are to respond to the world, how we are, can engage the world, how we can serve the world, but also how the world can be of benefit and blessing to us? Now, when you, when you think about those things I've just put before you, really you're dealing with questions that are, are pretty profound about the Christian's engagement in the world. And, and we're talking about the topic of cultural engagement. And that's a huge topic. And there have been more books written on that than I could possibly tell you this morning. And so, so by saying that, I'm not telling you I'm going to give you all the answers to that in one sermon today. Uh, nor do we find all the answers in one passage. However, I do think early in the Bible, this is only four chapters in the biblical narrative, in the biblical story. I do think we learn some things at an early part of the Bible about, about how we are to think about and respond to this world. In fact, as we look at what's being said here, I think it leads us to view and respond to this world in, in three ways that I want to show you. And they, they are these. I think we can respond to the world and as Christians, receptively. I think we're to respond to the world realistically. But then thirdly, I think, and this is so important for us to remember as, as the church of God, that we respond to the world redemptively. And so we can respond receptively, realistically, and redemptively. Now, when I say to us that, that there is a place by which we as believers in Christ and the church of God, that we can respond to this fallen and broken world receptively, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm putting us in a, in a different way of thinking, a different posture than at times people believers, churches have thought. In other words, the way that they have thought about the church or believers and the world is that they thought of standing against the world. In other words, that the way that we are to perceive this fallen, broken world is just simply by rejecting it because it is not of Christ, because it is fallen, because it is broken. Now, I think there's, a, there's, a, there's some reasons that, that Christian people respond that way. And, and, and a couple I'm going to give you this morning. The first of them is just... just it's ignorance, I think. And, and the reason I'm going to give you that, that reason, it's ignorance, is because it was, it was mine. Uh, I remember back when, when I first became a believer in Christ, I was incredibly worldly. And, and I was just a pagan, unbelievable pagan. And, and so when, when, when I came to Christ growing up in, in, in Bible Belt South, growing up in fundamentalist communities, I, I thought then that well, what it meant to be a Christian is that every single thing, that, that I may have enjoyed or every single thing that I was a part of or every single thing that I kind of participated in. Now, let me say this real quickly. You can't hold this with consistency, but it gets in our crazy, stupid minds sometimes. So I thought all those, those things back there, I have, to, I have to reject those things because now I am a believer in Christ. And there wasn't any thought about, well, you know, what aspects of these particular things are sinful or not. It was just rejecting them out of hand. And because I was a teenager, you, you can imagine what one of those things were. And probably many of you who are here today have done this exact same thing. It was about music. And it was like rejection of every aspect of any kind of style of music. Why? Well, because that music, it didn't come from a Christian or because that music, it didn't come from the church and because it didn't come from the church or because it didn't come from Christians, then that had to mean that all of those things were inappropriate for, for me now as a Christian to hold on to. And so what ended up happening as a result of that, and it happens in the church all the time, 
is we isolate ourselves. Many have described this as the way we ghettoize Christianity. We pull ourselves away from the world, isolate ourselves from it, and then we just sort of tag Christian on all of it. So we have the Christian this and the Christian that and the Christian all of these different things. And, and we think that somehow the, the way that we make things right and acceptable for us as believers is by adding Jesus to them or something, something like that. And we do this, this kind of thing all the time. And I think it's, it's something out of ignorance. And I'll explain why in just a moment. But there's another reason why I think we do this. And this one, this one is, is probably more serious. And I think we do this more often. And it is this. Because in the church of God, it, oftentimes we are not wise in the way that we do receive the things, that the cultural products of the world. Because we've not been wise in the way we receive them, what we'll end up doing, because we see the harm that they can bring to the church, is we reject the whole thing. So we end up throwing the baby out with, with the bathwater. And I'll tell you why we do this. We do it for incredibly pragmatic reasons. We do it because we think that if, if, we, if, we, if we pull these things into the church, then, then what will end up happening as a result is maybe the church will grow or maybe the church will be more relevant in the world that we're in or all those kind of ways that we think. And then we're not, we're not thoughtful that, that these, these things that we're pulling in, they actually can lead us to undermining biblical truth. And I can give you some specific things that we do that with. Now, when I give you these things, I'm going to back back up and tell you that I think there is a place where we can, we can receive these and be receptive to them. But I think we do these with things like, I think we do it with science. I think we do it with marketing and business. I think we do it with, with psychology. Uh, I think we do it with sociology. I think we do it with political theory. I think we do it with all of these different kinds of, of things. Now, I'll give you one of my pet peeves, and if you've been at Redeemer for a while, you've heard me talk about this. But I think this is exactly that thing. It's what's, what's called the homogeneous unit principle. And, and I haven't talked about this much recently because I think God is at work in our churches and, and teaching us something about what church should really look like. But here's what the homogeneous unit principle is. It's sociology. It's a sociological principle that basically is, is dealing with what is what, it's kind of the way people are, that people like to be around people who are like them. Okay? And so what has happened in the history of the Bible-believing church is we've taken that sociological principle, and because people want to grow their churches, because people want a lot of people coming into their churches, and so without great wisdom and doing it way too quickly, without thinking through the implications of it, what we've done is taken a sociological principle, applied it to the church so that we could have rapid growth in the church. But you know what the homogeneous unit principle is a denial of? Biblical truth. It's not the Bible. It, it undermines what Christ has done for us in making us one. It undermines how the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has brought us together, right? And so when churches do that, and, and churches have done this, evangelical churches have done this over and over again, well, what people who want to be serious about the Bible can quickly do is this. They just go, well, let's just throw all of that stuff out. Let's just remove ourselves from all of those kind of things as if none of that stuff can be of any benefit or blessing to us. Now, my point I'm making here is that we can actually, as believers in Christ, be receptive to the things of the world. Now, now let me say a couple of things about why. And it's just some general things, and then I'm going to look at the text with you. I don't think that that's sort of rejecting all the cultural products of the world. I don't think it, it fits biblical theology. I just don't think it does at all. I mean, on the one hand, we could say, and this is true, that what we have done as human beings is we have rebelled against God and we have walked away from God. Okay? And we have done that. But you know, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that does not mean, if you think about it, that God has utterly and absolutely abandoned this world so that we are, are, are in absolute evil in this world. It doesn't mean that, you know. God is still at work. In fact, I would say to you that every human being on planet Earth is the image of God. Now, that image is marred, it's corrupted, it's sinful, and it needs to be redeemed. And yet, the image of God is still in human beings. And so you, you, you should have some sense of expectation that there are things that people can do that actually would be, would be helpful and beneficial and to some extent true for even us to embrace. Okay? You, you think about the notion of God's common grace, and I'm certain you've heard that terminology, but if you haven't, let me explain it. Common grace, it is the, it is the kindness of God. It is the favor of God. It's called kindness. I mean, it's common because it's, it's over everything. It's, it's different from 
redemptive grace or salvific grace or special grace, which is, you know, special grace is that grace that saved you, that brought you in the relationship with God. It's what saved me. That's, that's special grace. Common grace is just, it's, it's God's sovereign providence over all things. And, and, and so when we look at this world, I mean, you, you understand something, that God is still reigning over this, that there are things that God has put in place over this. Or, I mean, if God were totally removed from this world, I'm telling you, as bad as it seems, it would be worse, okay? The common grace is, is still in this world. And as a result of that, what we should expect is that the, the world's cultural products can, in some sense, be helpful and beneficial to us. Now, with all of that set up, I want you to think about this passage. Because consider what's being said here. What you see in this passage is that many significant cultural products, they began where? Not from the godly line, but from the line of Cain. I mean, one of the things you see is that who built the first city? Well, Cain did, actually. Verse 17 says, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And when, when he built a city, he called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now, I'm not saying that Cain's desires were right. I'm not saying that Cain was desiring, and I'll come back to this more in a moment, was seeking to honor God in what he was doing or anything like that. But what I am saying is just, just because an ungodly person did this, just because someone that was of the seed of the serpent actually formed and founded the first city, that does not mean that all of the ways that we think about the city is that the city has to be evil. Why? Because an evil man started it. In fact... If you think about the biblical story from beginning to end, it started with a garden and it ended with what? What did it end with? You know, a city, the new Jerusalem, a redeemed city of God. OK, now what you also see, if you just think about it for a moment, is these descendants of Cain through Lamech. We see them establishing this, these and, and just consider. Consider it this way. These are things that are beneficial to life and to the world. You see this in verses 20 through 22. It says, Ida bore Jabel, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and, and have livestock. You know what that's describing? It's describing what you could say is animal husbandry, domesticating animals, food production, even providing, I think, for transportation for people. All of that's going on there. Okay? Look at verse 21. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play, play the lyre and pipe. This is musical instruments and music. This is the arts. That's what you see there. And then you look at verse 22. It says, Zillah also bore Tubal Cain, and he was the forger of all instruments of bronze and metal. This is mel uh, metallurgy. You know, in, in a sense, if you push it out a little bit, you're, you're, what, you're, what you're identifying here is technology and its advancement. You're identifying here science and, and its advancement. You see all of these things here, and they are coming from, these are, th these are let me say it like this. These are the ways in which civilization is beginning to take hold, and these things are coming from the ungodly line. And there is no sense. Sense. Hear me on this. No sense in which God is looking upon these things with displeasure. You just do not see that. In fact, I think it's just the opposite. If you put these four chapters together and you go back in your mind to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, where God gives what is called the cultural mandate. And that cultural mandate is for mankind to do what? To go and to fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over it. That's what these men are doing of the line of Cain. They're, this is being carried out by the ungodly. Now, we're going to talk in a moment about the reality of sin. because I, I don't want, I'm going to give you a little heads up on that because I don't want you to misunderstand where I'm going. But we're, we're going to talk about that. And that means that we have, to be, we have to be alert. We have to be biblically wise. We have to approach these things with some measure of sobriety as we think about how do we as believers receive the things that the world produces. I, I get all of that. However, to just simply reject the things that come from unbelieving people just because they're unbelieving people, I don't think that's what the Bible teaches us. Or to think that the way that, that we make a thing Christian is just to add Jesus onto it 
or to think that we as believers in Christ, that the way that we are to, to, to think about how we are to do and live our lives is to do just the opposite of what somebody in the world did. So they did it that way. So I got to do it another way. I just don't think we're, we're, we are thinking enough. I don't think we've put our mind to this enough. There's a place for us to be receptive. Now, even as that is true, let me now push into something. There has to be a realism in which we approach this, right? And, and there's a reason. It's, it's because of sin. It's because of the fall. It's because those things, they permeate and corrupt everything, right? And so we have to, we have to learn to be able to, to kind of work our minds and our hearts a bit as we work through these things and, and to be able to, to see the way corruption can move into anything and make things that may be beneficial harmful and corrupt. And that, that can happen. You know, uh, Francis Schaeffer, many of you know that name. Francis Schaeffer was, was a Presbyterian minister. He's one of the founders of our denomination. He started a, a, a ministry called Labrie. Schaeffer was a, a cultural critic and, and, and an apologist of culture. He engaged culture a lot. And, and I mention him to you today because he has, a, he has a great little book on Genesis called Genesis in Space and Time. And, and when Schaefer writes about Genesis chapter 4, he writes about Genesis 4 in this way. He talks about it as being the, the formation of two humanities. And I think he's right when he, when he says that. And you remember, I've already talked to you about how you have the, the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And I think that's laying out for us these, these two humanities that, that Schaefer talks about. Now, when we look then at the, the, the formation of these, these cultural products, these cultural works and benefits that are here that I think, I think we can look at in, in good ways, we also have to fully recognize that these things are coming from humanity turned away from God. You have to see that as well. This is who they're coming from. And this is clearly identified if you look again at verse 16. It says, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. Now, he did something he, he did not have to do. You know what Cain could have done? What he should have done? When he committed the sin and God came and confronted him over it, he should have repented. That's what he should have done. He should have turned back to God. He should have acknowledged the evil that he had committed and turned to a God of grace and mercy. But he didn't do that. And so what does he do? He goes away from the presence of the Lord. The text goes on in verse 16 to say, and settle in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now, when you see that little thing, east of Eden, that's not like the ancient way of giving a GPS coordinate or anything like that. I mean, kind of, I guess you could kind of do that a little bit and that, you know, you kind of like if you go east of Eden, you'd run into Nod, right? It's something more than that. And, and I'm going to give you some theology around that. You remember back when Adam and Eve fell into sin, they were cast out of the garden. You remember where God put the cherubim and where he put the flaming sword? He put it on the east of the garden. That was the entrance into the garden. Now, keep in mind, the garden was what? It wasn't just the vegetable garden. It wasn't just a nice little place to go and hang out with some flowers and trees. It was God's temple garden. It was the place where God met man. And so when God cast Adam and Eve out of the garden, then he puts the, the cherubim, the angel, and the flaming sword at the east side of the garden. It was away from the east where people were moving away from God. And so when it says then that Cain then goes, goes towards Nod, place means wandering, and it says from or east up from the garden, what that's describing, it's using language to say that he's moved further and further away from God. Okay? Now these are the folks that are being described here. These are people who have walked away from God, walked away from the presence of God, walked away from a relationship with God. And so that if you go back and you think, all right, here's the city that Cain is building. Well, that's not, you know, the ancient church father, Augustine, talked about the city of God. Cain wasn't building the city of God. Cain was building the city of man. And that's why he names it Enoch in verse 16, because he's naming it after his son, because it's about, it's about self-exaltation. That's what he's doing. All of this is about, about that. So then when you, when you all right, put this together for, with me. So as you, as you look at this and you say, all right, there are advancements that we see here in culture, in ways that we could embrace and use. There is at the same time, and this is corresponding, the advancement of sin and wickedness. And you have to recognize both of those things. You see, if we, if we want to come to the world with a sense of, 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 of real sort of biblical wisdom, then I think you can see those things. You can see culture 
and, and you can understand ways in which we can approach it and receive it, but we also, we cannot see it as just simply neutral. That there are these, these, these influences of sin and wickedness and evil, and we see this here. In fact, I think Lamech is the one who exemplifies the advancement of sin and evil here. Look at what it says in verse 19, and then we're going to look down at verse 23 and 24. In verse 19, it says, In Lamech he took two wives. The name of the one was Ida, and the name of the other Zillah. And does something stand out to you there? Yeah. Yeah, it's two, not one. <laughs> Remember the plan? Remember the design back in Genesis 2, 23 and 24? God, God made a woman and brought her to Adam. And then there are those words right around it that, that basically describe what marriage is, which is really one man, one woman for life. Okay? You know, if I were to say to you, where did the sexual revolution begin? It did not begin in the 60s. You got it? Yeah. It began a whole, whole long, long time ago. It began with polygamy, right? And it's, it's continued to manifest itself in the ways that, that even today, and I'm, and I'm not just making a cultural statement about the redefining of marriage. I'm, I'm talking about the way we, with the, even within the church, have done that exact same thing by not honoring what biblical marriage is and by not honoring it through permissive, permissive activities, through, through divorce and all of those kinds of things. We have not honored what marriage is. And so what you see here is you see this advancement in sexual sin and sexual immorality. But you also, you see in verse 23, I, I think you see it's the advancement in the sin of self-centeredness and pride. And, you know, notice what he does. Lamech said to his wives, and you know, Ida and Zillah, hear my voice. And this is a poem. It, he probably sang this. This is probably a song that he sang. And you could almost, you know, you could almost see this guy. I mean, Cain and all of his, you know, vengefulness and all that. He comes up with a song about being vengeful and you can, you can see him with this big old, I don't know, sword in his hand. This is actually sometimes described as the, the song of the sword. This big old sword in his hand. He pulls his shirt back and shows all his chest hair. He goes, ho, 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 holds it up and sings this song because he is man and he's roaring, right? It's just all about self-exaltation and, and pride. So you see the increase in sexual sin. You see that. You see the increase in, in self-centeredness and self-exaltation and pride. And then you just see the profound increase in violence. Ida and Zillow, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me. Think about that. I have killed a man for wounding me. Not self-defense. It's not eye for eye. It's taking a life for someone wounding he goes on, a young man for striking me. And I think that's pushing that. I think he's talking about the same thing, but it's pushing it to, to frailty, to even someone frail and weak, a young man for striking. I killed him. And then it gets to this extreme and it's like mind blowing when you hear what he's doing here, because it's, it's, a, it's a reverse. It's taking the things that God has actually done in grace towards Cain. So it says if Cain's revenge is sevenfold. And so God has given that to Cain. He's telling Cain, look, you're going to be OK. Cain's terrified that someone's going to take vengeance out against him. And so God comes to Cain and he says, look, nobody's going to hurt you, because if they do, then vengeance is going to be given by me sevenfold upon him. And so here's here's Lamech. He takes that. And then he says, if it's Cain is sevenfold, then Lamech is 77-fold. You know, the passage that Jamar read from the New Testament today, think about how different the kingdom of God is than that. It's not vengeance 77-fold. It's forgiveness 77-fold. That's the kingdom of God. But you see this advancement of violence, and, and we know that to this day. You know, I was, I was thinking as I was preparing this message, I, I, I do not remember the last time that I stood in this pulpit to preach to you that we didn't come into worship with our minds on something horrifically violent that was going on around us, in this country, in the world. Right? Every one of you, unless you live under a rock, you came in here and you were thinking about what happened in Paris. You know the lady that just got shot in Bellhaven? She was my neighbor. My neighbor. She lived two houses down from me. This is a violent world. 
This is a proud and prideful, self-exalting world. This is a world that doesn't understand in any kind of way the, the beauty and the wonder of appropriate sexual relationships, fulfilling covenant and understanding what faithfulness means. It is, a, it is a world that is just given over to selfish kinds of sexual behavior. This is the world we are in. And it's advancing. Even as there are those things that are so blessed, so much a blessing to us. And I would say this, and I think this is true. Counter to what so many people continue to think, cultural and technological advances cannot slow the pace of wickedness in our lives. It just can't. In fact, the way this works is our wickedness and sinfulness can take even those things that can be of such good, whoever brings them, and corrupt them for such harm. I could give you a list of examples of that. I'll give you an, just an obvious one. Just think about all the ways that the world has been blessed as a result of, of the microchip of computer technology. I mean, guys, the, the things, the good cultural products that are available to bless human beings as a result of that are profound. But I don't have to tell you the, the evil that has taken place in this world as a result of that same thing. That's this heart. That's its corruptions and its, its wickedness, right? You know, in this passage, you have Tubal Cain. And Tubal Cain was a forger of metals. And think about all the good that those things would have brought farming. Building, things for your home. But then those same things, those, those wondrous benefits and blessings. Well, you know, Lamech, he could take that same thing and make it into a sword and carry out 77-fold vengeance on somebody who is weak. Now, what all of this sort of settles into, at least in my mind, is, is this truth. And I think it has, this, this has eternal weight and significance. That no culture, and I'm talking about, I don't, you know, I don't care if you like to get in these debates about low-high culture. I don't care what it is. No culture, no technology, or scientific advancement can save what is wrong with us. And that's why as believers in Christ, understanding that we are to be wise and receptive, understanding we are to look at it realistically, I'm telling you, we have to look at this world redemptively. We must. We must. We can't produce anything that can, can deal with what's wrong with the world, ultimately. The world needs a savior. It needs something, better yet, someone outside of itself to save it, to redeem it, to come to it. And that's the last part of this passage that I think we, we mustn't miss, is that we see these wondrous glimpses of grace here, of, of redemption, of of that line in which God comes into the... Now, let me say it like this. The, the first part of this passage, I think God is in that as well because I think God is in common grace. But you see God coming redemptively in verses 25 and 26. It says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son called, and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel, for Cain killed him. And to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. 
And at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, I think there's, there's three things real quickly I'm, I'm going to show you here in this passage. You know, first thing is this, that God becomes preeminent again in this, in this story. And I'll tell you how you see that. It's by, by comparing what was said by Eve when she had her first son to now looking at what she says about her third. Right? When she had Cain back in chapter 4, verse 1. She said she was going to name him Cain. And you remember what that means? She said, I have gotten a man. And she goes on to say, with the Lord's help, but what you hear in that, I have gotten a man, is you hear her boastfulness. You hear her, her sort of saying, I can, you know, in that regard, in some senses, as I am woman, hear me roar, right? right? She names this son Seth. And notice what it says. And this is so important that you hold those things together. It says, God has appointed Notice who's done this. Notice who's come to the aid. God has appointed an offspring, another offspring. You know that word offspring is the same word that's used in the Hebrew as the word back in Genesis 3.15 where, where he promises the seed of the woman. You know what this is? This is kind of giving us a little hint. Here's Seth, this offspring of the woman. You know where that offspring goes, that line goes? It starts flowing through biblical history and it goes all the way down. And you know where it lands? It lands on a man. And that man is Jesus. And that man is our Savior. He is in that genealogy in Luke's, chapter, in Luke's uh, genealogy account. See, it all points to the grace of God. But here's something else you see here. You see an acknowledgement of mankind's weakness. So here's Seth, his son. And he has a son. And he names that son Enosh. Now, it doesn't tell us here what that word means, but what the Hebrew word Enosh actually means is, and this is really cool to think about it. He named his son frail, mortal, weak. That's what he named his son. And that's where we really are. And then if you look at the last part of this, you see this dependence on God. It says, at that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And you know, what is that? It's people acknowledging that we are hopeless and helpless and broken in ourselves. We are Enosh. We are frail. We are weak. We are needy and nothing we can do can fix that. I hope you know that today. Not one thing you can do can make that right. We call upon the name of the Lord. We, we turn to him. He is sufficient. Right? You know what this says? It's trusting God. It's, it's worshiping God. It's praising God. It's it's, it's praying to God. It's doing those things. It's, it's in, our, in our worship of God and bringing Him glory. I mean, one of the things that means is not only we call upon Him here in worship, but that always, it, it, it always moves out. You know, John Piper talks about motivation for missions, and he says the reason we do missions is because people aren't worshiping. It's basically what he's saying. And so we, we declare the praise of God. We worship God. And then we, we take that glory out because we want His name and we want His fame to be proclaimed in the world because we want others to worship Him. Now, for us... As believers in Christ, to really get that and to get it when we don't have power in the world anymore. And to get it when we don't control things in the world anymore. It's to remember something. We don't need the world's power to do this. Why? Because God is the real superpower. Do you understand that? Now, what that means is that, that in our hearts and minds, there's something we as believers in Christ have to come to believe. That what we're, what we're doing here as we worship God, this is powerful. Do you know that? When you pray, that's powerful. When you come to the table, that's powerful. When you're out there and you're, you're sharing the gospel and maybe people are rejecting you or maybe they're receiving you. There's power at work there. When you're living to honor God and maybe you're pushed over into a corner because you're the Christian and, and you are talking about what it means to know Jesus. There's power at work there. And we must believe that even when we don't see it in the world. 
I'm going to close by telling you this story. It comes from this book called A Peculiar People by Rodney Clapp. And he tells this really funny story about a friend of his. And this friend was, was a pastor of a church. And, and in this particular church, they just got a whole bunch of new carpet in the church. And it was on their, their communion Sunday when they were gathered together, brand new carpet in the church. And they would come forward and they would take of the communion wine from a chalice. And it was a metal chalice. Well, because of the, it was probably winter, because of the you know, climate and all that and that new carpet, well, the first person that, that walked forward, this is like really big buildup of static electricity. And so they put the cup out and he put it on his mouth. It, it shocked him so badly that it, it, it knocked him, I mean, it knocked him back and knocked him down. If he fell, it fell down, right? Now, it didn't hurt him badly, didn't kill him. That would be a bad story. I wouldn't have told you that if it, <laughs> if it, if it had done that. But it did, it knocked him down. Talk about taking communion seriously after that. <laughs> or that there's power in the blood. <laughs> but there is. There's power in the blood. Do you believe that? There's power in worship. Do you believe that? There's power in prayer. Do you believe that? Do you believe there's more power in prayer than what, all the things you can kind of manipulate to make happen in this world? That there's more power there? It's power in worship. Power in prayer. There's power in you being God's man and God's woman where you are, regardless of whether you're acknowledged or not, because who is with you? The God of power. And I hope you know that today. We have a, we have a world that is hurting, hurting, hurting. Don't isolate yourself from it. Don't reject it out of hand. There are ways that we can move towards it. We can and learn from it, receive from it. All that's true. Be wise in understanding with sin and recognizing those things. And live for the king in the midst of it. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time in your word and this reminder of these truths. Pray that you would just help us, Lord, to believe these things, to grow in them, and to live faithfully before you. In Jesus' name, amen.